and stand together this morning. Great to see you on this sunny Sunday morning. We're going to start with Jesus is coming again, and we'll sing all three of these verses. Here we go. Marvelous message we bring, glorious carol we sing, wonderful word of the King, Jesus is coming again, coming again, coming again, maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe going to be a wonderful day. I hope that we are ready for it. There's two ways to be ready for the coming of Jesus. One is to be saved, to know him in salvation, and two is to be walking with him. Because if you're not walking with him, you don't want to come back. You don't want him to come back today. You're like, can you can you do it tomorrow when I'm ready? But we have no idea when it's going to come. By the way, I will say this. When he comes, it's going to be between the hours of 12 and 1 a.m. somewhere. All right, so yeah. somewhere on the earth. But anyway, that narrows it down. But uh, we have no idea, but I will be involved. If, if I'm still alive when he comes or if I'm dead, I'm going to come back with him. And I hope that you are excited for the second coming of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. Let's sing all four of these verses. Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound.
been there. I never know what to do with that last verse. Uh, some verse, some versions say when we've been there 10,000 years. Some say when we've been there forevermore because there's no time. So how do you even talk about years and how do you even talk about forever? But uh, that's going to be our eternity forever and ever and ever done with problems and pain and sin Amen. and in the presence of Jesus. It's a, that's a wonderful worst case scenario if you're a Christian. If you're a Christian, the worst case scenario in your life is pain, trouble, sorrow, death, and then with Jesus for all eternity. Amen. And hope we're looking forward to that. Let's sing, Happiness is the Lord. Happiness is to know the Savior. Happiness is to know the Savior living of us within His favor, having a change. In my behavior, happiness is the Lord. Happiness is a new creation, Jesus and me. In close relation, having a part in his salvation, happiness is the Lord. Real joy is mine, no matter if the teardrops are. I Jesus in my heart, happiness is to be forgiven, living a life that's worth a living, taking a trip that leads to heaven, happiness is the Lord. Let's sing all of that one more time from the beginning. Happiness is to know the Savior, living a life within His favor, having a change. My behavior, happiness is the Lord. Happiness is a new creation, Jesus and me. In close relation, having a part in his salvation. Happiness is the Lord. Real joy, real joy is mine. No matter if the teardrops are, I found. Amen. So if you're saved today, you always have the Lord. You should always be happy. So why were you guys arguing on the way to church in the car this morning? I'm just kidding. Oh, that was us. I'm just kidding. On the way know? down the stairs. All right. But I hope, I hope that you are happy in the Lord. If you have Jesus and nothing else, you are a very rich person. You have all that life can offer and a wonderful thing to be saved and to have Jesus. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Uh, at this time, the choir is going to come and sing, and then right after that, on the back side of your song sheet, a couple of things. There's the choir song, and then right after that, we're, we're blessed this morning to have a special speaker, Brother Juventine Imuku, and his wife, Elizabeth. His wife is going to come and sing a song right after the choir song, and it's in an African dialect, so we have the words. I also have a translation there so that we can be blessed as well. So as soon as the choir song is done, Miss Elizabeth is going to come and sing for us.
the dialects in Uganda and it's called Luganda so I'm really preparing you for the mission trip to Uganda so that when you come you at least have a song that you can sing in one of our dialects but this song if you can open from Isaiah chapter 40 verses 31 it's about waiting on the Lord and I'm going to read this in Luganda and uh, you will read it in English so that you understand. So Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31 says, so, Na ye avo avali nila mukama, vali damu obuja amanyi gawe. Vali tumbira nebi wawatiro ge mpungu. Bali duka ngiro ni batakowa. Bali tambula ni batazirika. Those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount on wings like eagles. They shall run and not go weary. They shall walk and they shall not tire. And as we wait for the Lord's coming, you know, He's coming, He's coming soon. But He's asking us to wait. You know, wait on him, and that is what gives us strength. So that is what the song says. So you can follow along as you sing. The translation is there. Amen. 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 <laughs> Hey! 
we wait on the Lord, He's a God that never sleeps, that never slumbers. He's watching us and He will definitely come to those that are patiently waiting on Him. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that, Elizabeth. Uh, wonderful promise that is not to every person. God doesn't guarantee that you're going to have enough strength just randomly. But as you wait on the Lord, it's a promise for each of us. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. God will be with you. God will hold your hand. And a wonderful truth there, a wonderful promise. Uh, I assume that that was the correct interpretation there uh, uh, that you have there on your in your lyrics. But a wonderful truth uh, from Isaiah 40, 31. And thank you, Elizabeth. We're privileged this morning to have Brother Juventine Imuku, and he is from Uganda, Africa, a village called Soroti, and he is a pastor there as well as a doctor, and he's, I'll let him say whatever he'd like to about his work and the ministry there, uh, but some friends of ours that we've known for a long time, Brother Jim and Dina Ennis, they uh, have been going over there for years for missions trips over there. Charity went with them one time and uh, for about a week or so, and wonderful work that the Lord is doing there uh, in Uganda, Africa. And uh, so he's kind of like uh, Luke in the Bible. Luke was a doctor, and he wrote scripture. Um, Brother Juventine is a doctor, and he, and he preaches scripture. He doesn't write scripture, but uh, that, that's all done. But we're blessed to have him this morning. And I asked him to speak whatever, however long the Lord lays on his heart, it could be a half an hour. It could be two and a half hours. So what he usually likes to do, he likes to preach in one language and then interpret so it takes twice as long. No, I'm just kidding on that. Uh, but we're uh, glad to have him this morning. And uh, Brother Juventine, come and, and uh, open God's word for us this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for the opportunity um, English is not my first language, so I, my English may not be very good, and so that means you have to be very attentive to even just get a little bit of it. <laughs> but I thank God that I can see all of you. Uh, my wife is just sung. Um, we have uh, three children two girls, and one boy, and one grandchild. And so that means we are a little older too. <laughs> and uh, so we've been in ministry for uh, since 2000. And so that's about 25 years. And uh, Jim and Dina have been our friends for that long. I don't know how many of you can keep friends around for 25 years, but we have been, and it's been a great journey. We've seen God do great things, uh, beginning from bushes and nothing, and God growing up, uh, a lot of work, and um, it takes time. It takes time, and so it takes 25 years to see what God intended to do uh, all the way, all, all along, and so we Pastor Church in Soroti, that's our second church plant. We were initially in the far north west of the country. And now, about 10 years ago, we moved to Soroti, which is in the eastern side of the country. And through the years, God has allowed us to disciple men and raise them up and, and uh, send them out. And so we have about 22 churches that have been planted and maybe two will be going out next year. And so that'll Amen. be 24 total. So that's one of the things that God has called us to do, to, to be able to raise up men and women and send them to the mission field to do the work of God. And so that's a little brief uh, story about us, but also we run a, a Christian hospital in Soroti. And um, yeah, we preach the gospel. It's not like here many times you cannot preach to a patient. In Uganda, it's open. It doesn't matter who they are. 
and uh, we cannot put a knife on a Muslim woman to deliver a baby without prayer. And usually they, they, they ask for prayer. The moment we say, can I pray for you as we begin this surgery? They say, yes, 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 yes. In the name of Jesus, yes. And so that has been fun for me for, for so many years that I can, I can be able to pray in the name of Jesus to whoever comes uh, for health care. So, so anyway, Daniel gave me an open time. And so I wrote 10 pages of notes. <laughs> <laughs> both in the local language and in English, trying to interpret what I know into English. And so this morning, you know, I was reflecting back at the beginning of this year. And God gave us a threefold kind of, uh, of, mess of a message to our congregation. Number one, he put in our hearts to stir up the church to pray. And that we should be a praying church. That was number one. And so we started to, to pray. Every first two days of every new month, the church comes together for prayer and fasting to seek the face of the Lord. And so far, it's been good. The number has been increasing every month since we started in January. And then the other thing that the Lord spoke to us very clearly was that we are a church on a mission. Realizing that we are living in a broken world. I don't know for you if you have been depressed of some things. Things are happening around you in the community and you look at them and your heart breaks and bleeds from inside. I think I was getting into that place. And so you can actually be living in brokenness and confusion and overwhelmed by the culture that is changing very rapidly. Or you can seize the moment, okay? We can seize the moment and be those who are strengthened by the Lord through this time that we are going through. And so then, pray, being a praying church and being a church on mission helps us to keep our hands on the plow and our eyes on Jesus. Amen. 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 And then the other thing that the Lord basically put in our hearts was to try to help those within the body to be able to learn to do small, small businesses and financial literacy since the community, many of them are illiterate. So those are our threefold kind of um, vision of this year. And so this morning, I was reflecting back to that, and God just put in my heart a very small message. And the message, the title of the message is Being Strong Through Adversity. Being Strong Through Adversity. And maybe as we read this portion of scripture, it talks about the putting on the full arm of God. You might think about spiritual warfare, but I'm talking about the church, the believers being strengthened by the Lord amidst the adversity that we go through in life and things that are going around us. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless us this morning as we learn from his word. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. My prayer this morning for us is that as we read the scriptures, that Holy Spirit, you might quicken the word of God. 
to motivate us, to cause us to rise to the occasion, to stand up and be strengthened in the grace of God. As we walk in this fallen world and difficulty and pain, as we see our communities and the world crumbling and embracing sin and, and, godly, and, and, and godliness, Father, we are praying that you will raise up a remnant among us. We will be those people who will stand up for the truth, stand up for the faith and contend, not in our own strength, but in your strength that you provide. So thank you, Father. May you speak to us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so, <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 6, which I know all of us have read through, and I'm going to go through it slowly as the Lord has been ministering to me. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning from verses 10. Paul says to the church in Ephesus, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having guarded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having showed your feet with the pre preparation of the gospel of peace, Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all kinds of prayers and supplication, in the Spirit being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And so, as we read this book, you know, Paul writes this book. Remember that he's in prison in Rome, in the house imprisonment, and he's writing this book to a church that he loved. And he starts by telling them from chapter 1 to chapter 3 what God has done for us. And then from chapter 4, he writes our duty, our response to what God has done in view of the work of Christ, how the church needs to respond, living in light, walking in wisdom, how a family is to be, to be run, husbands and wives, and he, he talks about it things. And sort of like he comes to a conclusion of his letter to that church. And he says, finally, or, oh, the other translations say, most importantly, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So he starts this last section with this good exhortation. And I think it's a good word for us who are living today. We are living in a very difficult, perilous times. We're living in a generation where the church seems to be very weak and very compromising in their service to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have all these new theories and philosophies that are coming out of the new age that is coming in. People are beginning to interpret the Bible in tongues that we don't, we have never had, had about as they try to dilute the Holy Word of God. 
And if Paul was here today, I believe he would say to all of us, be strong in the Lord. There is a place for us as a church to be strong, to walk in strength in our walk with the Lord, drawing strength from Him. So we need men and women in this difficult time who are strong to keep going, to keep going, because we are being indented. We are being, we are being pressured to conform. The Bible is our way of life. Apart from God's word, we have no life. That, that's why I'm saying each one of us must be able to stand and stand to be counted in these days. We begin to see denominations that stood on the truth many centuries ago and for a long time beginning to embrace the new culture. We are beginning to see a new interpretation. I was told that some people are beginning to write the Bible so that it is, it is relevant to the new generation. Okay? Instead of the he that is masculine in the Bible, you make it both masculine and feminine. And so we begin to see these little things coming into the scriptures as well. And I'm actually told, don't read this Bible that's online. I, I, I don't remember which version, but I was told it has a lot of those compromises that are coming. And so if we don't make the Bible our way of life, we will not stand strong and endure to the end. We have a job to do. The world needs godly men and women to do the work of God. Being strong. Even Joshua, when God called him, Moses had died and the people were ready to enter the promised land. But at the same time, there were giants in the land. Okay? There was a battle to fight for them to enter the land. There was a very real enemy. Just like we face today. And God three times in chapter 1, verses 6, verses 7, verses 9, he tells Joshua, now you are going to lead the people. Only be strong and courageous. Let this... Let, let, let the law not depart from your mouth. Meditate it day and night so that you will be successful. God himself tells Joshua to be strong and courageous. Joshua leaves the presence of God. He goes to the people. Okay? And he tells the people what God had told them. People now turn to Joshua. And he, they say to him, Joshua, just like we followed Moses, we shall follow you. And whatever you say, we shall do. Only be strong and courageous. Because even the people expected their leader to be strong and courageous. As parents and grandparents, friends and elders, employers, employees, whatever we find ourselves doing, God requires us to be strong in the grace of God. The yeast of the Pharisees is being spewed all over, all over to contaminate the dough so that there is pervasiveness. We are being bombarded on TVs and on television and newspapers and radios and internet. The pressure is on for us to compromise. But the exhortation of the Bible is be strong. And so here, Paul knowing what would become of the church that is so loved, he said, my brethren, be strong in the Lord 
in the power of his might. The exhortation of the Bible is for us to be strong. You see, God would never ask us to do something that he cannot enable us. He is able to enable us to be strong, to be able to carry on to the end if we choose to believe him and obey him in his calling. So Paul says at the end of this epistle, be strong. And then he goes on to to tell us how to be strong. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. But how do we do that? And he shows us how we can be strong, we can be anointed, we can carry on with the work of God. And he says this is how it is to be successful in our walk with the Lord. I don't know for, 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 for you in the U.S., there are seasons that come when people uh, talk about fashion, talk about dressing. I remember in the 80s, I was a little boy and I was in a primary school and there was a dress code for success, okay? And people, young men, and women dressed in a particular way, and that dress was called a dress of success. For men, it was a kind of trouser, which was very tight from the hips, and then from the knee, it would go very big. Okay, imagine. I, 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 we called it bell bottom, but I know bell bottom here means something else, right? So that was a bell bottom. Everyone, every young man desired to do what? To dress like that. And the shoe was a very sharp one. At the end, it was called Sharpie, right? Was it here also in the 80s? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know for you if people want to dress a dress of success. And the women dressed on a, a kind of a, a flowery dress. It was smaller up to the hips, and then it would spread a little bit. And it was called maxi. Okay? And so that, those were the dressing of success. And Paul here says, this is how to dress for success. Okay? Verse 11, he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Put on the whole armor. We need to realize that life is not like an encounter, encounter group or a bonding meeting or a playground. I've never viewed life since I got saved as a playground. It's a battleground. It's a battleground in which you and I, unless we are strong, we will not be successful. We will not even be successful as moms and dads and grandparents or Christian workers. And we need to realize that there is a battle going on and you better put on your armor. And many believers are not armed up. They are not dressed up. Okay? It will be like the U.S. Marines when they stormed Afghanistan and they are putting on their pajamas. Or they are putting on bathing suits. You see how that picture doesn't relate to a Marine? Okay? Somebody who has been trained for battle, who must win the war, who has a real enemy, and he goes to the battlefield on pajamas, okay? That's, a, that's not a good picture at all. <laughs> and so I suggest to you that many Christians are dressed like they're dressed on pajamas. <laughs> I think they're supposed to be called jammy Christianity, <laughs> okay? They're not dressed properly. 
And so Paul says, to be strong in the Lord, you need to put on the full armor. It's a battle. Take advantage of the equipment that God has given us to navigate life and fight a good fight of faith. Pass the pajamas to goodwill or whoever wants them. Put on the right attire that God has given us so that we can stand against the wiles of the devil, the clever attacks that Satan wants to bring against us. And here is what you are to wear, the whole armor. Don't leave a piece out, lest you stand very vulnerable and to be done in by the devil. So verse 12 says, put on the armor, because we are involved in a real battle. Let me emphasize this very well. Verse 12 says, put on the whole armor, because we do not wrestle against flesh, and blood, but again as principalities, these evil forces, it's not flesh and blood. And so anytime we see people behaving in a certain way, we should be sensitive to know that there is a force behind this practice. And any time I'm wrestling against flesh and blood, wrestling against people, struggling with people, I'm fighting a wrong battle. It can be parents. It can be children. It can be employees, employers. It can be relatives and neighbors. For you see, there is unseen spiritual battle in which you and me are engaged and we must get to the root cause of the problem. We are fighting spiritual entities that is causing tension in our families, causing tension in our marriages, problems with each other, problems with, at work. There are spiritual forces at work that aggravate the situation and irritate our spirits. And these forces, evidently, Paul gives us a clue that they are highly organized. And as a believer, you better understand some of the things. They are very highly organized. And Paul says, we fight against principalities. Principalities, Daniel chapter 10 gives us a little bit of clue. Remember Daniel sets his face before the Lord. He's praying and fasting for 21 days and he's not getting the answer. But at the end of the 21 days, the angel who was given the answer for Daniel arrives and he says, sorry Daniel, from the day you set your face to seek the face of the Lord, the answer was given. But the principality over age, over Persia, which today is Iraq, withheld me. So there was a, a, a demonic force over that territory called Iraq or Persia that started to fight the angel from delivering the answer that Daniel was seeking for. And it took Michael, the archangel, to come and fight. And so Daniel was able to receive the answer. There was a principality over that region. I don't know for you when you go to certain places. I go to the country of Nepal quite often. The first time I went there in 2014, I was depressed the whole trip. I could not believe the spiritual atmosphere of that country. It was sickening. All the people given into worship of idols. And, and you reach a place and you say, it's really dark here. Have you ever noticed that? You go to a place spiritually, you, you begin to feel the darkness and the depression that the whole community is given to. Paul calls it a principality. So when you go to a place or when God plants you to a place, remember 
that there could be spiritual forces over that land. And as a child of God who has been given authority in the name of Jesus, we begin to pray and take authority of the word of God over such principalities. So these are highly organized. And Paul says, we wrestle against principalities. That's one form. The second form we wrestle against powers. What are powers? Powers are entities or demonic forces that keep people in bondage. Remember Luke 13 verse 11, Jesus was going around and he sees a woman who was bent over. Okay, she was bound. And it's written that there was a spirit that had kept her bound. And Jesus had to catch, cast that spirit away and she straightened up. There are these forces of darkness. When one time a friend of mine, um, a police officer took me to LA many years ago. And he took me where he used to work, where all the drug addicts were. I was depressed to see how bound, how oppressed these people were. That's what Paul calls power. So we wrestle against principalities. We also wrestle against powers. Powers are these, are these entities or forces that keep people bound. If you find an alcoholic and he can't know where he's going, you know that there is a force that is holding that man or that woman that they cannot even hear the word of God. And sometimes we have those people in our families. What do we do? We need to take authority. We need to go to the root cause. Sometimes even taking them for rehabilitation doesn't help. And then the third group are the rulers of darkness in this world. The dark system that we have in this world. Sometimes you find governments making decisions. You find education systems making decisions. You find in the entertainment circles, you find all these things that are going on. No wonder Paul says, pray for those in authority that it might go well with you. And that's our responsibility as believers, to pray for those who we find in authority, whether it's a local authority around, whether it's a mayor of a city, and all those that rule around us, we need to be praying for them because they are vulnerable. They are vulnerable to make decisions that are ungodly. And so our job is to lift them up and pray for them that the will of God be done. That as they deliberate and debate, and it, sometimes we're going to criticize it. How oh, this man has made this, this. This is a bogus decision. But what did we do? What did we do as a church? Did we pray for them? Did we ask God to control their minds? The fourth one Paul talks about is again a spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Okay, that's the fourth one. People who seem to be heavenly. You, when you go to, to India and, 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 and Nepal, you find a lot of Hinduism and Buddhism. They talk about reincarnation. Okay, that's what they believe. The devil has shifted their minds so much. But also among us, we see cults all over the place. We see those who don't believe in Jesus as God. And they are called the church. They are called Christians. In fact, I was looking at, we're doing census sometime this month. No, next month. I was looking at the, the religions that are listed. There's Latter-day Saints. There are Mormons in there as religions. Okay? They are in our constitution they are being recognized but we know but we know there is a force that has deluded them that they do not believe the truth so we see these four categories how Satan seemingly divides his forces over regions over individuals over governments and cultures and over mysticism and cults. So, when I look at this, either you get worried and afraid, 
which sobers you up. For me, it sobers me up. Okay? Because I must take seriously what I have been given. It sobers me up that this is a spiritual battle which we must fight. And God has given us what? Weapons. He's given us the ammunition that we need. He says, verse 13, Therefore take up the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Paul repeats the word to stand twice. He begins by, be, be, by, by saying, be strong in the Lord. And then as he goes to verse 13, he says, take the whole armor of God so that you can be able to stand in the evil day. In other words, he's saying, you cannot be defeated. You can stand and be strong. No matter what territory or region you live in. You can stand when you live in Uganda, in Africa. You can stand when you live in the U.S. here in Orange County. You can stand when you live in Brazil. All believers, they can stand. They can stand no matter which school you go to. And we can stand no matter who is in state house in Uganda or in the White House in the U.S. Or who is in the Senate or who is in Parliament. We can be able to stand. Whatever it is, when we find ourselves in the evil day, we can stand because we have been given the ammunition to be able to stand. So Paul says, take the whole armor. The evil day comes. There will be an evil day for each one of us. And you're going to make decisions. And you're going to make a choice. There will be crossroads that we have to make a decision. And I pray that we'll always choose Jesus. And we'll always choose the word of God. But unless we are sober, knowing these things, knowing that there are principalities, there are powers, there are rulers of darkness, there are spiritual hosts of wickedness, we may be fighting wrong battles. And when we reach the crossroad, there will be options. And may the option that we choose be the option that is given in the confines of Scripture all the time. So Paul says, there, verse 13, take up the whole arm of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand. Stand therefore. This is how you stand. Having guarded your waist with truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So he begins to give us some kind of address code on how we are to stand like a guard like a soldier who is on attention. Your loins guarded about with truth. That which is not seen, but it is underneath. That personal area of our lives, it's held up because you are a man or a woman who speaks the truth. It is the character issue. Yeah. It doesn't, it does matter a man's private character. Things that are underneath the surface. Loins guard about with truth. You see, many people have an outward show. Most times, they want to present themselves as, as good. But that doesn't define the character of a man or a woman. It's what we do when no one else sees us. That's who the man is. That defines our character. Things that are underneath the surface. We do well and be successful and stand once we learn to speak and live the truth. 
And I choose to make that choice. Remember the story of David. When he should be in the battlefield at age 50, he decides to remove his armor. Okay? All the soldiers are in the battlefield. He stays in the palace. What happens? He gets involved with Bathsheba. Kills her husband. Tries to cover it up. Cover the whole deal up for one year. But then he writes. He writes Psalms 32. Have you read Psalm 32? Let me read something just briefly there. Psalm 32. It's something that David writes when he was not truthful. When he tried to hide. He writes something very, very interesting. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is a man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silence, my bones grew old. Through my groanings all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon you, upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. He felt the pain in his bones, in his heart. And, and because he was trying to hide the sin that he had done. He was dry like drought. In his spirituality. He wasn't honest. He was not honest with his life. He had a show. He tried to put a show. But inwardly he was dying. And we sang some songs this morning. Should Jesus find us inwardly dying. Then it won't be good with us. Are we honest externally and internally or are we struggling with some issues again the grace of God is able to help us I read a story long ago of a woman who locked her keys in the car and she asked her husband who was 50 miles away 80 kilometers to bring the spare key. You know those days it was these keys. The ignition was with a key, not with a button like today. It was with a key. So you needed a key to open the car, but also to ignite the car. Her key was locked inside. So she calls her husband, who was 50 miles away. But then her friend, as the husband is driving, probably is a, only 20 miles to, to where they are, the friend finds out that the rear door was open. <laughs> right? And the friend says, Oh, if he gets here, he's going to be mad because at least the rear door is open. So the wife basically opened the door, pushed in the latch, and banged the door and locked it. Wow. <laughs> the husband came and said, The car is all locked. She wasn't willing to be honest. Paul says, put on the armor of God. Guard your loins with truth. With truth. And put on the breastplate of righteousness. Breastplate covers the heart. Doing what is right all the time. It's funny how many people, many people's hearts are exposed and having chest pain and heart aches and broken hearts because they know things are not right in their lives. And they know it. I really believe from many years of counseling, a lot of emotional distress is directly linked to this problem. The breastplate has been removed. 
If things are not right, your heart is exposed and you'll find yourself in big trouble. If I'm not right, if I'm not living rightly, my heart is going to hurt. I'm not going to be strong in my walk with the Lord. The joy of the Lord goes down and the condemnation sets in. And you basically give the devil a foothold. A breastplate protects the heart in righteousness. It is doing what is right, whether there are people or there are no people. And that's what the Lord expects us. That we are honest to ourselves. But also as he looks at, uh, looks at us, he sees purity and holiness and truth in us. Whether people are there or there are no people. The tendency is to be good when people are there. And then you go back home and you have little, little things that are hidden, habits that are not seen, um, uh, things that you, that you try that you don't want anyone to see. And that is the danger that we find ourselves in. You remove the breastplate of rightness and your heart is going to be exposed and you are going to feel pain. So, I now have my, my heart covered by doing what's right, my loins guarded with, by living it with truth, and now Paul says, and then your feet being shod in the preparation of the gospel of peace. And so, Paul says, this is the other thing that you need to put on, put on shoes of the gospel. It means I don't walk on people, but I get to share with people, okay? Sharing the good news of Jesus Christ as I walk through the day, I get to tell people good news, that Jesus loves you, Jesus saves, he died for you, he can set you free. Let me tell you the cure for gossip. You want medicine for gossip? Okay. And slander? Be about the good news. That's the cure for it. <clears throat> You're not going to be on phone and... Ying, 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 ying. <laughs> Is that the right way to... <laughs> eh? Possible. Can you imagine the other brother, the other sister? No. If you're about the good news, you're going to pick that phone and say, isn't the Lord good? Can I pray for you? And the person goes, yeah, 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 and you say, oh, let's, let's trust the Lord for it. You become a peacemaker when you have dressed your feet with the preparation of the gospel of truth. That will cure all the slander and all the gossip that we talk about. It's about the good news. The gospel is not walking on people, but walking with the people. And as we go about through our day, all the day when we wake up in the morning, as we live our day, we are sh sharing with Christians and non-Christians, encouraging the Christian to go on. And for the non-Christians, telling them what Jesus has done for us, that you can be changed, you can be saved. And, and that's very important for us as we live as pilgrims in this country, in this world, okay? That our feet are not open. Because when you remove the, the, our, the shoes that Paul talks about, that, that we should be shown in the preparation of the gospel, our feet are going to be naked and thorns and, and snakes and all kinds of things are going to get to us. But when we have our feet should in the preparation of the gospel, we are going to be protected. And then the other thing that he says, verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wickedness. Above all does not mean most importantly but literally covering you all, okay? 
the wicked one is from the word panarus, from where we get our word pornography. Fiery darts that the enemy shoots against us. Take an example. We are here this morning. You have your Bible. You are intentionally studying and following. And suddenly, a thought comes to your mind. You start thinking about the other person who cut you on the freeway. Okay? And you're like, if I had a gun, I would have finished him up. <laughs> okay? And you're here reading the Bible. Where did that thought come from? It's a fiery dart. And that's what the enemy throws against us all the time. You remember things. You remember the pain you suffered. You remember the heart. You remember all those things. Those are called fiery darts that the enemy throws on us. And Paul is saying, let me get it. Paul is saying, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts because they are going to come. A friend of mine many years ago told me, you cannot stop the bird from landing on your head, but you can stop him from nesting and making home on your head. That's the same idea. The fiery darts are going to come. Sometimes lust will be thrown into your mind. What are you going to do with it? Sometimes hatred can be thrown into your mind and, and suddenly you just, you, you just feel something coming. It's, it just comes like that. I don't know how many things go through your mind. I believe there are billions of things that go through my mind every day. And I must put on the filters. So Paul is saying, covering you all. Okay? The shield of faith. Paul is chained, remember, the Roman soldier. Okay? And he's writing these things. He's saying, so what about those shoes of yours? What are they? He's taking notes. And what about that, that helmet on your head? Okay? Well, what about that little, little knife on your side? Mm -hmm. He's writing this letter, but he's chained to who? A Roman soldier. And, and so he had this shield of faith. And Paul is asking, what is the shield of faith for? Or what is your shield for? And Paul is making <clears throat> spiritual sense out of that. What are we to do when the enemy fires a fiery dart? We are burning with gossip, with impurity, anger. Those are fiery darts from the enemy. They are not part of, part of what Jesus has given us. You know that. What are you to do? Above all, a shield of faith. Remember, Roman, Roman soldiers were very, very advanced. They had these shields to protect them as they fight hand to hand. But as the Roman soldiers are advanced, in battle. The soldiers in front would lock their shields, okay? And they moved towards the enemy. The ones behind locked their shields over their heads. And the ones on the sides locked their shields around them. And remember during those days, people would fire fiery darts or spears or arrows, and they would fire them directly. I have a bow and arrow at home. Should you come home and it has spikes? If I shoot you in the abdomen, you can't remove it. You have to be surgically removed. It. That's my little weapon. I've never used it, but I don't know. So, but then they would also shoot these arrows up in the sky and to come down on the army. 
So if you were not inside that covering, you would be hit. So the shields, the arrows would just bounce on the shields and fall on the ground. And the soldiers would be protected. That is the idea. You see, you got come from this idea. What do you do when you're fighting? All these things, cynicism, ghosts, fiery darts from hell. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, Paul tells Timothy, Flee youthful lust and follow after faith, righteousness, charity, and peace with those who call on the Lord out of pure hearts. So Paul tells Timothy, flee. He doesn't tell him, flee and go home. Or flee and go and, and watch TV. <laughs> he says him, when you flee youthful lust, go and follow after faith, righteousness, charity, and peace together. Together with those who call upon the name of the Lord with pure hearts. So basically, Timothy was to run to the assembly. To run to the church. To run where God's people are gathered together. You run from sin and you take cover among your brothers and sisters. You go to the congregation. You go to the prayer meeting, you go to the Bible study, you go to the men's prayer breakfast. I heard about that. I wish I could come back. Why? Listen. Because together, as we worship the Lord, as we study the Word of God, there is a covering that is present around us, right now, among us. Mm -hmm that you never find individually. And that's the point here. Paul is saying, above all, which I translate as covering you all, you, you, you run to the assembly. That is why it is a fallacy for somebody to say, I'm not going to church. I'm going to be home. And I believe this is online, right? So some people are online, okay? Those who are online, Next time come to church because there is a covering that we receive when we come together and worship the Lord and sing hymns and spiritual songs and hear the word of God. And after the service, pray for one another, hug one another. There is a covering that we, you will never find at home individually. I like online services. Once in a while I do when I can't go to church. But 99% of my time in a year I go to church because I know there is a covering. The Holy Spirit is working among God's people and you miss it if you're home. So you flee, but run to the congregation. Run to church. No wonder Paul said in Hebrews 10, 25, do not forsake the assembling together. There is something that happens when we assemble together so that we can pray together, so that we can share with one another, so that we can encourage each other. As we are, and, then, and then as we pray for one another, people are struggling over different things. We all come together, pray for them, and we all overcome together the junk that Satan throws on us, those fiery darts. It's junk. He keeps throwing them to our face. And Paul says, taking the shield of faith. And that's very important for us, so that we can quench the fiery darts, just like the, the, the Roman soldiers would, would, would be able to overcome the fiery darts that were thrown over them. So do we, when we come under cover together, Amen. together as a church. Individual is okay, but together. God has called us to live life together. Not individually, but as a fellowship and as a body of Christ. 
And as I finish this morning, I think I've taken a little bit longer. But Daniel gave me three hours. So anyway, <laughs> right. So let me finish up. Okay, verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Okay, the helmet of salvation. What is that? Helmet of salvation. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 8 specifically where Paul is talking about the coming of the Lord. Let me um, read that passage to you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. It says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. So, the helmet of salvation, what is it? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8, specifically Paul talking about the coming of the Lord. As we see the world and the cultures collapsing around us, we can end up depressed, by the way, and afraid. Unless we have our minds constantly in the, to the coming of Jesus Christ. Our minds must constantly be thinking about the coming of Jesus Christ. The blessed hope. The hope of our salvation being the second coming of our Lord. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse verse 8 and 10, this hope, the hope of Jesus coming back. You see, when things are going so bad, you know, by the way, I don't know for me, I see, I see that it is soon. It's coming. It's coming. I tell people in our country, recently we passed a law Again, it's LGBTQ plus plus whatever whatever <laughs> else is there. <laughs> we did that, and people are like, "Yay! Great! The president signed it." I said, "For now, let's celebrate." But this perversion is not going to stop. The end is very near. This hope of heaven. Hope of eternity for a believer. You can count Peter, James, John. You can count Paul. You can count those fathers of our faith. They all lived their lives with a hope that Jesus was coming anytime. And this kept them sane and happy and doing the work of God. All these great saints of history lived in that anticipation that Jesus was coming any time. And we must be cognizant about that. It's going to happen. Whether he comes for all of us as a church, universal church, or he comes for you or for me. He's coming. He will come. So keep this hope over your head. The hope of his coming. I can watch all the world and everything crumble, but I'm not going to be depressed because this hope keeps me motivated. It motivates me to purity. It motivates me to ministry. It motivates me to the right priorities of life. As I think about the coming of the Lord, as I think about eternity, as I think about being with Jesus, Anytime it motivates me to do three things. One, purity. Two, ministry. And three, the right priorities. As I make decisions every day, I make decisions that are consistent with the work of God. And then he talks about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, this is so important. The Word of God here is refers to the rhema. The spoken word. It's different from the word of God in 
in uh, Hebrews 4.12, which is the Logos, which is, which is this, okay? What Paul is referring here is, as we study the Word of God, the Bible, the Logos, this is the Logos, right? As we study this, and as we live life, life is going to present us with a lot of issues, and you're not going to be saying, what does the word of God say? What about, what about this one? What about? No, it should be in us. And so whatever thing we meet, it just comes out. The Holy Spirit will quicken that word. And we say, this is what the word of God says. This is what I should do. This is, this is, this is something that I need to consider. Okay, so Paul is saying that we, we need to be able to to take the helmet of salvation and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is the spoken Word of God. It's different from, 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 uh, from Hebrews 4.12. Now, when Paul is writing this, he's looking at the soldier because he's chained to a soldier. The soldier who is chained to him doesn't have the, the long Hebrew sword, the two-edged sword. He had a dagger on his side. I see all the policemen in America, their belts are full of all kinds of things, and there's a knife. All the time there's a knife. That little knife is for hand-to-hand -hand combat. That is the word of God in our hearts, that we speak to every situation when it comes. That's what Paul means here. And so, that word, the right word for the right situation, the Holy Spirit taking the word of God that you've been studying, that you've been learning, that you've been meditating, it comes back to you on the moment you need to confront the situation. And so Paul says, part of our weapon, part of our spiritual arsenal is that we know the word of God. Because then we will be able to take the sword of the Spirit. Because remember, there are all these wiles of the enemy. There are all these, um, uh, these um, <clears throat> there are all these um, arrows that are being shot at us in the mind. But there are also relational issues, okay? So when we know the Word of God, we are then able to apply to every situation. The Word of God must become our life. It must become. And that is why we need, as a child of God, if you're going to be strong and victorious and being able to overcome and endure to the end, we must, we have no choice but study this word. We have no choice. Study and meditate on it. Finally. <laughs> Finally. If you're not able to fight hand to hand, you can still do something. If you're not able to reach your sister who is in a different state, or your child, you can still be able to reach them. And this is the final part of Paul's encouragement to the church. He says in verse 18, praying always with all prayers and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. If you cannot do hand-to-hand -hand combat, you can still go anywhere in the world through prayer. You can visit Soroti while being here. And remember Juventine and Elizabeth. And when you pray, something will happen there. We can be home and pray for our friends in South America and things will happen there. And this is like the long range artillery that we can deploy. It can be deployed anytime and it's effective everywhere. 
one of the people who taught me leadership. He was an Egyptian professor. And he said, in Egypt, they're Muslims. He said, they can refuse your love, those Egyptians. They can refuse your gifts, but they are defenseless before our prayers. And that's how he warned most of his family members. He just prayed for them. You can pray a blessing on somebody who is in a different place. You can pray healing. You can pray deliverance. You may not be there to reach them physically, but you can join them. You can join with so many people. And I think this is where we might be very lazy. Sometimes we pray for a few minutes, but let me tell you, we can sit down and name each one of these members of the church, name by name, and say, pray for my sister Jane, Lord bless. I pray for my brother Peter, bless him. I pray for, I pray that go around, go around. Because here Paul says, with all kinds of prayers, okay, pray always. With all prayers and supplication, you can, you can be seated in one place and pray for hours without ending. From the government, the local authorities, to your brothers and sisters, to your children, to your grandchildren, to your neighbors, to your pastor, to everyone. God has given us an opportunity that no one else has. The gift of prayer. We can break strongholds. We can cast out demons. We can be strong and pray blessing and decree and 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 and, and take authority over many things through prayer. So Paul concludes this letter to the Ephesians. He says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. But he says, Pray for me also. Maybe I should end with that. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. He's in jail, but he's doing ministry. He's not a vacillating or complaining. He says, pray for me also, that I may be effective, even in prison. So, he concludes saying, be strong. Be strong in the Lord. And this is my prayer for you as a child. Be strong. Be strong, men. Be strong, women. Be strong in the power of his might. In the face of our enemy, we can be strong of our principalities. We can be strong of our powers. We can be strong over rulers of darkness of this age and strong against spiritual hosts of darkness in heavenly, in heavenly places when we guard our loins with the truth. When we put on the breastplate of rightness, when we shoot our feet in the preparation of the gospel of peace, tell others about Jesus. This is one thing that I'm passionate about. I want to tell somebody that Jesus loves, wants to save you. Above all, a shield of faith together, coming together, praying together, sharing together, being in a fellowship together. A helmet of salvation, setting our minds on things above. The coming of the Lord is nigh. So we keep our minds there even as we serve him and do the work that he has called us. And then, sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Know your scriptures. Know this book. And finally, pray and watch. Praying for all the saints that we can all stand. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for these words that you put in my heart to share with the church here. 
I pray for them. I pray for, for strength. Pray for courage. Pray that, Lord, we will be those who you, when you come, you will be dressed well. You'll be dressed well, ready for your coming. That you can say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come, enter into the joy of your Father. So God, I pray that you will encourage us, build in us faith, strengthen us where we are weak. If there are parts of the armor that are down, Lord, may you help us to put them on and stand and be strong during these difficult days that we live in, these last days. But your church will be strong. There will be men and women around the world that are strong in the grace of God. I pray your blessing upon them and upon all of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for watching today. If you have made a decision to follow God in some way or would like prayer, let us know at flbc at cox.net. We would love to connect with you, pray for you, or send you some resources that can help you in your walk with God. If you would like to know more about how to go to heaven, visit us at folbaptist.com slash heaven. If you would like to give financially to support our ministry, you can do so at folbaptist.com slash give. Thank you and God bless you.